सेवन फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव Nishail, welcome everyone, and then hand over it to you. In five, four, three, two, one. We are live. Nishail, welcome everyone, and then hand over it to you. In five, four, three, two, one. We are live. टीवी should i share the screen and check whether i can play i'm just calling this is calling a show नहीं 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 सो लाइव यू कैन स्टार्ट ओके सो आई विल स्टार्ट गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग दिस इज डॉक्टर दिस इज डॉक्टर रुता कुलकर्णी प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ असम इंडिया आई वेलकम यू ऑल for this webinar this is our second webinar in the series of ask the masters and this is hosted by the john mukhopadhyay and dr altaf kausa and i also welcome all the speakers dr ritesh pande dr indra singh dr ritesh runu and dr shamshul hoda i welcome all the uh, uh, and dr ravi chauhan so let's start the webinar and i hand over the proceedings to dr manish prasad over to you manish ma'am thank you so much for the uh, address and uh, without any further ado i think uh, we'll straight away go to the presentation and may i request uh, dr ritesh pande who is the state representative uh, from bihar for assami india he is an associate prof at aims patna and he will be um, showing a presentation presentation to us on uh, club foot i'll request all the speakers to please stick to time so that a good discussion can happen within the stipulated time we will try to avoid asking any questions between the presentation only once the presentation finishes then uh, uh, it it will be better so over to you dr ritesh pande kindly go ahead with your presentation thank you sir
so is it visible yes uh, we can see this and we can hear you <clears throat> okay so good evening uh, everyone so my case is um, of a 7 year old girl with uh, recurrent ctv on left side and it was uh, an idiopathic club foot uh, the child was managed by serial ponsetti cast during her infancy and again she underwent the posterior medial soft tissue release at the age of 3 years and to us she presented again with her recurrence with a demeglio score of 13 and it was the deformity was quite stiff and her lavag ponsetti functional score was 48 out of 100 and these are the clinical images and this is uh, her gait pattern uh, we can see an equino chivovarus deformity on the left and on the right side, although she is having uh, an equinus, but it was uh, a compensatory thing. Uh, clinically on examination, there was no fixed deformity on the right side. And these are the radiographs on AP view. The telocalcaneal angle was uh, around 18 degrees and telo first metatarsal angle was 48 degrees. <coughs> I'm sorry, I could not... Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Your your radiographs are not visible. Yeah. yeah please go ahead. Achha, okay. Sure. So there was no uh, congenital bar actually on the radiographs. I would like to clear that here. So the first thing which comes in our mind is whether to go for an acute correction by repeating the uh, soft tissue uh, surgery uh, with or without osteotomy or to go for a gradual correction. So these are some of the relative indications for a gradual correction, a severe deformity, uh, particularly a stiff deformity, then unilateral uh, involvement with foot length discrepancies. And if the neurovascular structures on the concave side of deformity are at risk. And Elizarov uh, technique offers a minimally invasive procedure fewer neurovascular and skin complications. It maintains length and has better accuracy of correction and it corrects all the deformities simultaneously. So in this case, we did a percutaneous section of plantar fascia. Also percutaneous Z lengthening of tendo Achilles was added and the Elizabeth frame was mounted. And uh, once the child was comfortable and pain-free, that is, um, I think on day three, we started with the differential distraction. And it was uh, uh, double on the medial side uh, when compared to the lateral side. And this was the frame that was used here. It consisted of a TBL base, which consisted of two complete rings, one posterior half ring to be mounted on the calcaneum, and one anterior half ring for the metatarsals. And they were connected with distractors, one on either side. So these are some of the controversial issues, uh, like uh, should we use a Taller pin or a Taller wire? When to add an osteotomy? What should be the duration of frame after correction of the deformity? And how to decide and when to do a tibialis anterior transfer? So we can discuss all these issues uh, in discussion section, but the literature is divided over the use of Taylor pin. Uh, there are a lot many studies who have not used a Taylor wire or Taylor pin, but still have reported very excellent results. Uh, however, uh, few studies which were published recently, uh, they suggest the use of Taylor pin so that uh, better control over the movement of the segments can occur. Similarly, indications for the osteotomy uh, is also not very clear. There are several studies which have suggested different ages for which uh, uh, they have recommended the osteotomies. And the one by Hoshni et al, which was published in 2002, uh, they didn't use the osteotomy even in an adults. However, some relative indications for this osteotomy are an older age, 
if there is congenital fusion of the bones of the tarsal bones very severe and very stiff deformities and the neurological deformities so in this case uh, we didn't use the taylor wire or taylor pin similarly osteotomy was not done and uh, uh, we relied on uh, we relied just purely on the uh, distraction of the soft tissues and these are the images at 6 weeks of differential distraction showing uh, satisfactory correction so after that the frame was removed immediately after correction and uh, we added tibialis anterior tendon transfer in the same sitting after removing the frame and an above knee cast was given for 6 weeks followed by a below knee cast for another 6 weeks and an ankle foot orthosis thereafter so the deformity uh, correction was nice but uh, the child developed purulent discharge from the tendon transfer site and uh, so the wound was explored and we found the ethy bond used uh, there to be infected so it was removed and the wound healed satisfactorily thereafter and these are the images after 12 months of removal of the frame showing good correction with a demeglio score of 5 and lavag ponsetti functional score of 85 and we have used this uh, this protocol except for the uh, tibialis anterior transfer part in 30 feet uh, in 23 children the mean age was 8 uh, years and we followed them for at least a minimum of 36 months and we observed a satisfactory correction in all the uh, parameters the radiological functional and clinical and uh, particularly the radiological and clinical parameters improved till 18 months uh, after surgery after that the improvement was uh, further improvement was not there but the functional score continued to improve till around 36 months and the results were better in uh, children uh, who were younger than 8 years of age thank you very much uh, thank you uh, dr ritesh firstly for sticking on time and secondly a very very beautiful presentation uh, so uh, as i had uh, Uh, laid down in the beginning only uh, may i uh, go to uh, dr john mukopadhyay sir our very senior teacher uh, sir uh, would like to hear your comments uh, on the management of the of the case sir and if you could share some pearls of wisdom sir sir you are muted sorry so i think the elizrov is sir a... sorry can you hear me am i audible yes sir yeah yeah please go ahead sir so i think uh, there's no doubt that the elizrov is a very good method for treating these older children with stiff deformities couple of things which i would uh, put in is one i don't think doing a tibialis anterior transfer just as you remove the frame is a very good idea because you will always have problems with the pins and then you risk infection which happens so i, I would be very wary of <clears throat> straight away uh, would wait for it the patient later and if they have dynamic virus they have good correction but still have dynamic virus when they are walking that's when i would do a tibialis anterior transfer <clears throat> the thing is i would i think after you get the correction it's a good idea to keep it in that position for some time before you take off the frame rather than taking it off immediately okay otherwise i think the results are great so uh, well done yeah so altaf you got something to add yeah 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 good evening sir good evening everybody uh, this was a nice presentation dr ritesh Thank so you, few points few points i would like to just uh, comment and just uh, ask you first thing that i agree with uh, professor john that uh, doing it to be less anterior immediately i don't think it would be that great an idea keeping in view the infection as well as well to know whether the patient really would need it maybe after you did your uh, completed your treatment and then casting and then brace and then ask the patient to move around then you would actually decide whether he really needs or not number 1 number 2 that you do percutaneous red lengthening 
So what is my concern regarding that is since this is a powerful tool and this is a long-standing deformity, you need to generate a good amount of power to correct the equinus and other deformities. Now that the tender Achilles, we have already done the percutaneous uh, in this tenotomy. So there's always an apprehension that the tendon might give in. This is out of experience because you see, once you have enough force generated across the ring to create uh, this uh, equinus correction, a lot of stresses are on the tender Achilles. And the techno Achilles, which has been already weakened by us in this uh, tenotomy, might give in. So you have to be very cautious about that. Number two. Number three, what was your protocol? That like you did a differential distraction. Did you correct in between manually? Dr. Um, sir, actually, yeah, yes, sir. So because uh, I agree you see with what, you, sir. What my point is that this is a rigid frame. So you have put in the distractors. So whatever correction you have achieved is only a stretch, kind of a stretch, unless you reposition it. So you wouldn't achieve the correction. So when would you do that? So, sir, actually, uh, uh, our protocol is uh, we start distraction, uh, like uh, uh, we start twice uh, on the medium that, side. That's and, fine. So, that's okay. fine. I have no issues so, on that. Then how do you judge the correction? What do you do for seeing the correction? Ultimately, this is a rigid frame. So, both sides, yes, the rods are fixed. So, you were, uh, your deformed foot is fixed in a rigid frame. How do sure, you sir. come to know? That so, it is corrected now. So, sir, it is basically uh, based on the clinical examination only. Like uh, when uh, I get that. we I get we that. look at the we look from the plantar aspect of the foot, and uh, uh, once I get a straight lateral border and the heel varus is corrected, then I uh, examine it from the lateral uh, view to look for any residual equinus deformity. So in most of the cases, the equinus is simultaneously corrected when we distract uh, uh, for the correction of heel virus. So if still some residual equinus is there, I will shift my distractors more posteriorly to correct the equinus. And but I suppose you have already you have the distractors posteriorly and you have to meet in a lateral distractor. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but yeah. Ritesh, I in your frame there was no distractor on posterior side. You have yeah, he a, had, he uh, Dr. Uta, he <laughs> showed that the frame he showed that the, it has a distractors posteriorly. There were the hinged ones. That's no, fine. No, no, Dr. And, Dr. Altaf, there, there. So I think so, I think what Altaf is trying on, to say. Uh, two distractors, one on medial and one on lateral side, but nothing on dead posterior side. Yes, ma'am. It so was it was not there. One. Ah, it, it posterior distractor was so posterior distractor was not there. We actually start yeah. with uh, the correction of heel virus. So for that we put the distractor one on the medial and one on the lateral, and then once that heel virus is corrected, we shift those two distractors posteriorly oh. to correct the equinus. So it's a two stage process. So yeah, if residual equinus what, is still there, we are shifted say. more posteriorly. So finally, I come back to my question, Ritesh, that yes, you are now distracting. So you are distracting medially and laterally in a differential uh, manner as well as medial and lateral for the virus also. Yes, sir. So this, since this is a rigid frame, so the foot has to move somewhere. Sure, sir. Okay. So do you reposition at times? Do yeah, you I, just disengage? I, do you disengage I the don't frame? Disengage. No, no, sir. I, I don't disengage actually and check the uh, correction. In doubtful cases, uh, I will go for a radiograph uh, to see the telocalcaneal uh, angle there. So if it is uh, normalized, like in CTV, it will be uh, decreased, the telocalcaneal angle. So that is one way of uh, confirming the correction. Otherwise, clinically, if the lateral border has gone straight and there is no residual equinus, then uh, it is quite safe to remove the frame. Because so the Ritesh, tissues are so much distracted, uh, distracted, after removing the frame, you can just feel that everything is... Uh, very flexible and it okay. can be corrected. Okay, manually. let me share my experience is that like this is the rigid frame. You wouldn't know just that it second. has corrected. Just one second. Let me just... Please. Read. Please. Please go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. What I, what I was just trying to say is that what Altaf is trying to say is it's a good idea to disconnect the frame yeah. and correct exactly. it. It really helps a lot if you're doing this. 
Only, only, only problem is means and anesthesia. So, because it's almost impossible to get your hinges exactly at the right spot. Okay. So, you can't get your fulcrum at the right spot. If you can do that, then maybe you don't need to do that. Otherwise, the best way to do is to dis disconnect your frame, use almost like a Ponsetti maneuver. So, your thumb on the head of the tailor and abduct the forefoot and then reconnect. It reduces the stress on the entire frame considerably and also helps you with your correction. Because, sir, why I say that, why I say that, since you are trying to do it in the medial lateral fa fashion and then correcting the virus yeah. from an rigid space. But what the deformity is, deformity is actually a three-dimensional deformity. Yes. So it has, it has spination, it has other aspects. So by simply distracting on medial and lateral side, you will only correct the one dimension. So like uh, Professor John said, that's always a good idea that you disconnect it and then put it in a position and then do the rest. Otherwise, I'm afraid that it doesn't do that great. Because like John, Dr. Okay. John said that you don't have one single uh, Cora. You don't have one point that you would arrange your hinge. So it is a three-dimensional deformity that gets corrected by using different forces. This reduces the time. Third thing I wanted to say is about the Taylor pin. So of late, for a few years, that I have changed my policy towards exactly on the Ponsetti principles. But for getting those principles reflected in an illusory frame, needed a change. So I modified it. I'll be publishing it soon. For the last three years, I have done lot many cases with excellent results. I do use the Taylor pin. And then that Taylor pin, I keep with the tibial frame. So that tibia and this becomes a unit. And then rest of the foot and the calcaneum move as a this, uh, this pedo, uh, calcaneum pedal block. Then at the time of correction of the equines, I will loosen that uh, rod so that you have chances of correcting that. I'll share sometimes that fully. I may be doing, I'll be showing this in, inshallah, in coming uh, this Iocon at this. Uh, we have, I have my presentation, so I'll be discussing how I modified it. So in one frame, I'll be doing all corrections on the quantity principles. So that's another point. So, so I think I this think, is I good. Think we need to get on. Right, sir. I think this is enough for this. Great. Uh, so, Dr. Altaf, when you're correcting virus, you don't yeah. touch the uh, calcaneal ring to the tibial ring, is it? No, no. What I mean to say, I, I have the Taylor pin within the calcaneal. The rest, I leave it right like it happens in the Ponsetti. You have left the calcaneal block as a unit. So the calcaneal pedal block moves underneath the talus. So that corrects your varus and other parts. I think it will be more prudent to show it while I show it yeah. at the conference because otherwise it wouldn't be possible to yeah. uh, just explain in here. Okay. Okay. So what so, are your uh, indications for adding osteotomy actually? It means at what age do you recommend? Osteotomy, if you have a flat top talus, that time you may need to add. But otherwise, I have been treating pa uh, patients up to, I think, 9, 10 years without even osteotomy. I think there are some very rigid feet which you just can't move. Okay. So I think that's where the osteotomy helps. Otherwise, you don't need an osteotomy for the deformity or the age. It's really the rigidity of the foot that will decide. It. It's not the age which is the deciding yeah. factor. It's the hard rigidity. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, ma'am, with your permission, yeah. if yeah. if uh, we are through with the discussion on this, there was a point uh, question on YouTube. What yeah. was the sequence of correction? I think uh, Dr. Ritesh Pandey and um, uh, Dr. Altaf also they quite clearly, um, I mean, um, uh, he mentioned that. They go for the heel virus correction, then the uh, medial uh, border straightening, followed by equinus. If I'm uh, if I'm correct, Doctor Ritesh, that is what you had mentioned. Yes, sir. It's so, a staged process, basically. Yeah, it's a staged virus procedure. So, yes. So, uh, uh, may I now request um, uh, Doctor Jaswinder to kindly come up with this presentation? Doctor Jaswinder is uh, <laughs> ready. Uh, okay, Doctor Ritesh's present. Sir, let uh, Doctor Jaswinder uh, finish it. Okay. He's already there. So, okay. Dr. Jaswinder happens to be uh, a consultant at the Paris Hospital, Patna, and uh, he'll take us through a case of uh, congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia. Let us see what he has in store. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, everything's okay. Okay. Yes, you you so, are audible. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll be talking on the management of congenital pseudo arthrosis of tibia. Congenital pseudo arthrosis of tibia is a rare disorder which is seen like one in one lakh forty thousand children. Around half of it is associated with neurofibromatosis one. The difficulty or the characteristic of this disease is there is a fracture uh, at some time in tibia and which is very difficult to achieve union. There are various surgical techniques which are available for the management of this condition like intramedullary rod, external fixator with elisero ring, onlay grafts, cancellous graft, vascularized fibula and many more. But overall the primary union rate from the index surgery from various studies, it ranges from 22 to 100%. So I'm going to present uh, a girl who had presented to us uh, last year, uh, who was three years at presentation and she got a uh, congenital pseudoarthrosis of left uh, tibia. So these are the clinical pictures. Uh, there was a deformity of the tibia at the upper third, upper two third, lower one third junction and uh, roughly around uh, 100 degrees of deformity could be seen in the sagittal plane. These were the x-rays. There is a fracture at the uh, upper two-third, lower one-third junction. The fibula is also involved. There is a sclerosis at the fracture site. And the, again, the angle of deformity would be nearly about 100 degrees. So uh, we had planned to operate her. And these are her clinical pictures on table when taken in the OT. So those are the markings with the uh, skin pen. Uh, with the methylene blue, that, that is a tibia and that is a fibula on that side. So we expose the uh, tibia and the fibula together with a curvilinear anterior lateral incision on the tibia. And that was the exposure of the tibia, that is a deformity seen. We acutely corrected the deformity by kind of uh, cutting the, uh, the spiked ends. We removed the uh, periosteum uh, to a great extent. And then at the, in the same setting, we also kind of corrected the uh, deformity for the fibula also. And then we end-to-end -end interpose the tibial fragments so that kind of there is a jamming of the proximal fragment into the distal. And then we harvested bone graft by splitting in between the iliac crest. And then we placed the uh, cancellous graft there. And then after that, we passed a, a calcaneo taller tibial wire that is an intramedullary wire going from wire going from calcaneum towards the tibia and then we uh, put a elisero frame on this three full rings proximally and one half ring in the foot and those that is a deformity which is a uh, correction seen on table in different views at the same time we also did uh, because there was a, a good amount of shortening when we had cut the tibia so we also did a, a proximal uh, corticotomy between the first and the second rings. Uh, those are the CM pictures. There was some problem with the CM. So that is kind of uh, some uh, dark patched scene. So that is the wire, intramedullary wire going from the foot. That is a corticotomy scene there. And uh, with a good deposition of the, uh, the CPT side. So uh, while distracting, this is around uh, one and a half, two months when we got the X-rays done. So that is a, uh, the lengthening being seen proximally, the docking of the CPT side with the uh, graft there, the fibula, there is kind of some uh, defect there, which uh, we expected to form with time. And uh, this is at around three months, our clinical pictures. And uh, when a good amount of uh, equal amount of length was achieved on both the sides, then and uh, healing was seen. We also made the patient to walk at that time. So uh, at about uh, uh, 20 centimeter of length was achieved on either side and good healing was seen. Uh, this is around at nine months when uh, the, the fracture as, as well as the corticotomy side uh, seemed good uh, bone formation. And then that time we planned for the removal of the frame. So these are the intra pictures. We removed the frame. There was some valgus, which can be seen there. And then uh, uh, we had put a above knee cast and we made the patient walk after that. So these are our x-rays. There is around five to 10 degrees of proximal valgus, probably uh, when the uh, 
you know, it is at the proximal corticotomy side. There was some deformity there, but as such, the fracture had healed. It's still uh, not a good bones formed there, but we do expect with time that it will form there. And then we had given a brace. And th this is her last uh, walking video, which we got just two days back. So overall, from various uh, papers, uh, resection of the uh, sclerotic edges and the surrounding fibrous hematoma is advocated and reopening of the medullary canal. Uh, the actual alignment is uh, advised to be achieved on table with correction of the angular deformities. A maximum cross-sectional area at the uh, CPT site is advisable, which is different in different studies. Uh, some studies do advocate for the ankle stabilization so that uh, uh, deformities like ankle valgus and procurvitum of the distrit tibia is corrected at the same time, or it does not come on, on the ongoing process. Uh, stable fixation with a ring fixator coupled with the transfixing wire from the uh, far away from the sclerotic lesion is advocated. Again, a protective bracing along with or without, depending on the surgeon's choice, uh, intramedullary nailing is advised. And finally, a length, uh, uh, lengthening by distraction osteogenesis is advisable. From various paper, it has also been advocated or recommended that an Elizero frame should not be used before three years of age because healing is better after that and there's less chances of refracture. BMP is advocated. We do not have any uh, experience with that. Uh, use of bisphere phosphonate, especially like uh, zolendronic acid is advocated one to two weeks prior to the surgery and thereafter, after the surgery, like three months after the surgery. Uh, we do not use it routinely before the surgery, but uh, at three monthly interval after the surgery, we do it. Uh, uh, bone graft in form of uh, cancellous ileic graft is advisable. We uh, take it from the ileic crest. We do not regularly use uh, fibular stabilization as such, but again, some papers do advise it. An intermediary stabilization, as we do it from the distal calcaneo, uh, tailor, tibial uh, nail, or uh, uh, solid K wire is advised. We routinely do it. And finally, uh, use of Eli from this is from uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin's Joseph paper that use of Elizero technique with transfixing, transfixing of the ankle and subtalar joint along with the use of cortical graft without operating on fibula, they are associated with better outcome. We do not have any uh, experience with a vascularized fibular graft, though it is said that it uh, gives a faster union. The refracture rates from different studies are near about 50% and from Pele and Choi 4-in-1 technique, it is 100% uh, union without any refracture. Another case, uh, similar type. So there's, there is a uh, deformity at the lower third junction and managed in almost the similar way. And that is a five-year follow-up of this patient. Another patient who had presented at, uh, sorry, at three years of age, again, uh, same kind of management, solid union at three years follow-up. Good clinical, good clinical outcome at three years of follow-up. And one more last case to show, this is still ongoing treatment, deformity on the left side, correction almost in, with the same principle, that is amount of periosteum we, we excise, and that is uh, our frame on table. <clears throat> so since 2016, we had seven patients of CPT, and we regularly use intramedullary wire with the Elizero frame. The mean age was 5.3 years, and average frame time in all these patients was 9.4 months. And a union was achieved in all these patients. An average follow-up was two years. There was one patient who got a refracture and it was managed conservatively and it united. So to summarize, congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia is a difficult disorder to treat and union rates from various studies ranges from 50 to 100%. Deformity correction along with stabilization with intramedullary wire and Elizero frame gives good results, at least in our hands. And it should not be advocated before uh, three years of age. And we do give brace for a prolonged period so that the patient does not land up in fracture again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jaswinder. You've got a good uh, number of uh, cases for a case series also, as far as CPT is concerned. So may I now request um, uh, uh, Dr. John, sir, to kindly uh, I think give I'll his comments. Altaf, Altaf, go first since... And, Dr. Altaf, sir, if you're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Jaswinder, 
Excellent Sir, presentation. I have a couple you. of concerns. What would be the weight of those rings? Steel rings using in a small child. I think uh, overall, if I make a frame together, it would be around one. I mean, two kgs, two kgs, sir. Yeah, yeah. A small child to handle such a big ring. That's one issue. So, right. both you, you, do you have any experience with carbon fibers? Handy. And you don't need too much of the kind of way to be used. Sir, number we do one. use. Okay. Number, answer, one. number okay. two, number two, that you are continue this uh, TPL wire, intermodulary wire coming in the diaphases, coming out in the diaphases. So it's not more proximal. So do we have naturally these because of the disuse process, they have all the possibilities of having a fracture at that place. And then third, if you have used the graph to begin with, why didn't you attempt a cross union that would give a wonderful result? Uh, okay. Because so you are using a graph, you are fractioning, you are doing all the things. And third thing, do you remove the hematoma circumferentially? Do you get any difficulties in removing that? Right. May I answer now? Yeah, please. Right, sir. So, uh, uh, we regularly remove circumferential hematoma periosteum. We do it regularly, sir. Proximally and distally. One. Second is, from last uh, three cases, we have been, three to four cases, we have been attempting from, for cross union. Uh, uh, we take away the introsious membrane. We expose the fibula. And we do it. We do it. Uh, it regularly from last four cases, I would say. And uh, about that diaphysial wire, I would say, yes, there is a chance of, uh, uh, of a fracture. There is a possibility for that, sir. But usually we don't attempt to pass it in the cortex. It, it happened in one of the cases we did it because we felt that uh, the, the bowing was so much that it kind of tried, it uh, came out proximally towards the cortex diaphysis. But usually if we get good uh, alignment correction, then we pass it towards uh, the center center in both AP and uh, lateral view. And that would be just even proximal to the our corticotomy sites. So. so it would be a and great it, idea also. Why not to use the full PALI protocol that you use on endronic acid before and then do the grafting, removal of the thanks. hematoma. And I wouldn't suggest that like in that case that you had done, the fibula was open at this, it would weaken your uh, tibial union. You did the simultaneous lengthening. So the gap increased naturally, it had to. And I don't expect it to fill in because this is not a normal bone. This is a cedar orthotic uh, fibula as well as tibia. So it would be, I think, a great idea to me if, if you did uh, this uh, fibula osteotomy at a higher level so that the at the junction of the cedarthrosis side, you have a good support in the lateral side as well. And you are expected to have a non-pathological area of the fibula where you would do the osteotomy. Yeah. Agree? Yeah, agree. So one or two, two things. One is that uh, we uh, ideally, we, you should actually try to uh, get a cross union between the fibula and the tibia. And we've started doing that, but we were not doing that earlier but it hasn't actually increased our number of refractures. The one refracture we had was actually at the corticotomy level and not at the uh, pseudarthrosis levels. Interestingly, maybe it related to the wire. Uh, the, the case that you actually presented, when did this valgus occur? Because that's, that's something which, is, which ideally should not have happened, okay? Because it's happened at an upper level near the, where you did your lengthening. And I think maybe in the casting time, you should have yeah. checked that that valgus did not occur because I think that valgus will be a problem for that child. One more question, That's sir, I'd ask. Uh, we uh, do use, we have carbon rings, but usually we tend to use it in the upper limb. We have never, I have never seen it being used in the lower, in our so, setups. Okay, so we have used it in the past in the pseudarthrosis. The only problem with the carbon fiber rings, it's very thick. Okay, so it reduces the amount of rings you can put in in some cases in the smaller child. So that's right. because sir, why why I I, I, I agree I agree the that carbon part. rings are lighter. There's no doubt about it. It makes the X-rays a lot easier. So there are advantages, but they are thicker rings. So in a small child, sometimes you are fiddling around for space with them. Well, why why I say why I sir recommend carbon fiber rings? Sir, you don't actually need too much of metal. It's a small child, small bone, and putting in too much with adds to its disuse process. 
that's why i tend to use the carbon fiber because otherwise these are heavy rings so, so small I, child i mean i agree i agree that it's lighter but at the age of 3 these children are able to walk around quite happily with that ring okay so 3 4 5 it's not a problem if you're doing it in a 1 year old or 2 year old which pehli does then it's a different situation and pehli also if you use pehli's protocol then you should also use bmp if you say use the complete pehli protocol but we are not using the bmp bmp is costly costly yeah, okay, so, so exactly have... so but if you are using doing the full mm-hmm. pehli protocol you have to use bmp and i right. i have my reservations against using bmp in these small children because we are still not sh- absolutely sure about the teratogenic effects of it yes no but about the zoledonic acid sir at least it, it prevents the porosis maybe i i'm not entirely convinced that you need to use it initially but yes later on i we will use uh, bisphosphonate but yeah i that may be an uh, thing to do but i think zoledonic acid also has some problems with it so we have seen complications with its use in the smaller child so uh, dr singh do you always pass the wire through the calcaneus uh... And yes, ma'am. Possible. Yes, so ma'am. We are. Do have a fracture of wire, you know, at the level of ankle, uh, because I had that problem in a couple of cases, and. I... Ma'am, we did not have any complication as such till now, and we are we have been re- uh, regularly doing and that. To remove the distal end of distal part of the wire. So I think that's obviously. So how long do you keep the wire? Two joints. You have to worry about that. Ma'am, we. Uh, we are not removing wire till i would say adolescence after so, the removal of the ring the wire is still there then you immobilize uh, so patellar and ankle joint for a long time yes ma'am but we do have to give support and uh, that is uh, well uh, advocated by dr benjamin joseph and team uh, there are a couple of questions on ortho tv and uh, they are all related to the valgus and possibly a rotational deformity also in the first case dr jaswinder which you had showed so i would like to know from you as well as our senior experts whether it is a problem of stability of the frame or whether it is linked to early weight bearing is i mean can some light be thrown on it sir i would say yes i mean we did not make the patient walk very early it was only after 3 months she started walking so but uh, there is a possibility that the uh, though it did look that uh, the corticotomy osteogenesis was good and the bone there was a solid union there also but yes there was some valgus when we did remove the frame and we hope that with time there is a possibility that it might remodel how much lengthening did that child require Around four centimeter, three and a half to four centimeter. Usually, this valgus is a tendency that if you lengthen beyond five, six centimeters, then it is bound to happen. Right. So it may be because of that. So lengthening at the fracture side is a known complication of limb lengthening, particular yes. lengthening going into procurbatum and procurbatum uh, and uh, valgus. Sir, we have been lengthening uh, in. regularly in all the cases we did not find it in in any other case the second thing is in this child there was also that if we see the x ray the fibula support was not there which we were discussing uh, some time back so probably that led to increase in the valgus there true and uh, altaf the thing you mentioned about osteotomies most of these most of these cases the fibula is actually also has a pseudarthrosis at that level so yeah. the question of uh, doing the corticotomy higher or the osteotomy in the fibula higher did not arise in these particular cases but i can see in a case that the fibula is intact there you can do that yeah so so <clears throat> thank you very much uh, dr jaswinder uh, if the senior experts allow can we move to the third case so it will sure. be dr dr uh, runu dr ritesh runu and uh, sir will be taking up a case of infected non union tibia sir happens to be a very senior uh, um, orthopedic surgeon he is an additional professor at igims patna and i uh, hand over the thing to you sir please carry on with your presentation yeah. thank you yeah good evening dr shamsul yeah today i am the speaker and dr shamsul is my uh, driver he will be i am just simply sitting in the car right sir. can i start dr shamsul 
just a second, sir. Uh -huh. So visible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is a case regarding a patient, uh, 18 year active male who had a gap non union of tibia with proximal tibial virus deformity and shortening. This patient, uh, can you move to uh, move to second slide? Yeah, <clears throat> this was the X-ray when the patient presented to us in April 2019. He presented with difficulty in walking due to left knee virus, and there was shortening. The shortening was around 1.5 centimeter. On examination, his limb was scarred due to multiple surgeries and there was bone gap. There was a bone gap and the patient was walking with a slight equinus with the help of walker. Next slide, please. On history, taking his history, the patient had injury two and a half years back in January 2017 when he had a fracture of tibia and fibula. Plaster was applied. Next slide. Six months in plaster, the fracture didn't unite and it was plated. This, uh, this was done elsewhere at a, a different center. And next slide, please. Six months of plating, the patient started having discharging sinus. There was lytic area in, at the fracture site without any sign of union. So the surgeon removed the plate and it was the fracture was stabilized with LRS with excision of all the uh, scar tissue and the infected tibial segment. And there was a proximal metaphyseal corticotomy was done and distraction was started. Next slide, please. In July 18, this was six months after prime uh, surgery of LRS. We can see that good regenerate was formed and the middle mobile segment moved towards the fracture site. The gap non union was uh, covered, but docking was not done. Next slide, please. 10 months after this surgery, this patient presented to us. And this was the situation. He had a proximal TBL virus deformity. There was uh, regenerate was has consolidated. There was a gap of around uh, four and a half centimeter. Fibula was united. He had a stiff ankle. Next slide, please. Now the problem with the patient was the functional problems were that inability to bear weight on left lower limb. His knee was in virus and 1.5 centimeter of shortening was there. Radiologically, there was gap non-union of tibia trophic type. Proximal tibial virus deformity was visible and the bones were osteoporotic. Next, please. The treatment related questions which uh, was there, that was the skin condition was poor because of multiple surgeries and infection. Whether we should go for single or multiple stage correction was another question. What should be the implant? Then internal or external fixation, which, should, which will be better? And if external fixation, which type of fixation is better, whether it is uniplanar or multiplanar. Keeping all these in mind, we went for pen and paper uh, planning. Next slide, please. So we did a pen and paper planning and we found that Elizarov is the best answer for this. Next, please. In May 2019, according to deformity of the fragments, Elizarov frame was applied. Next, please. This is the lateral view. The frame was applied with hinges on the anterior medial side and posterior lateral side. And then distraction was done. Next, please. Differential distraction was done. This is the video. Is video running, Dr. Samshul? No, sir. Video not running, sir. Okay. So this is the video regarding the patient is walking on with the frame with the walker after surgery. This is one month post-op. Distraction has been started. 
and we can see that some regenerate is being formed and virus deformity is gradually corrected. Next, please. This is two months post-op. The virus deformity is almost corrected with, uh, with a good regenerate is formed and the gap non in is being covered by the movement of the middle uh, mobile segment. Next, please. This is four month post op. This is four month post op. Next, please. This is six month post op. You can see that good regenerate has formed and there is docking at the gap non union site. Next, please. After six months, completed six months, the frame was removed and we can see that virus deformity is corrected. There is docking at fracture site, but the tra uh, transversal, uh, transversing trabeculae are not formed. Complete union is not seen, but that area was painless. Frame was removed and patient was kept on POP slab for uh, uh, three weeks. Next, please. The patient is, uh, uh, the limb is straight now. In, in this video, the patient is able to move his limb without any movement at the fracture site. Next, please. This is seven month post-op in December 19. We can see that regenerate has consolidated. Now the, there is no gap non-union, but there is no solid uh, union at the gap non-union site. After that COVID era came and the patient was lost in follow-up for a year, one and a half years. Next slide, please. In May 21, the patient sent his X-rays and his photograph. To, uh, that was two years post-op in which we can see that virus deformity is corrected, the regenerate has consolidated more and some bony union is seen at the gap non-union site. Next, please. That was the patient two years post-op, patient is standing and he's walking. Next, please. And the patient presented few days back in November 22, we can see that good union has occurred at the gap non-union site. That is complete six years after injury. The patient has good union with correction of deformity. Next, please. This is AP view. Next one is lateral view. Good union at the gap non-union site. Next. Patient is standing. Next, please. He's able to squat but due to a stiff ankle, he's not able to squat completely. In next video, he is walking comfortably without any limb. So we learned in this case that multiplanar deformity correction is a dynamic process with multiplanar device. The placement of hinge needs to be changed according to change in deformity correction. And in this case, we did that. The hinges were changed at few uh, one or two times. And Elizaro frame helps in correction of multiplanar deformities in a much easier way. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Indeed, a difficult case and a perfect example where nature also helped you out <laughs> yeah. a lot. I think I, you would agree with me. So, uh, <laughs> Sir, I had a basic question before uh, putting the case through to Dr. John and this thing. Sir, why was the Elizro frame removed at the first place at that time? Would you have liked to keep it further? I mean, just a curiosity, sir. Six months was over. The gap non union site was painless. Limb length discrepancy was corrected. And we thought that after removing the frame, we will mobilize the patient with brace full weight bearing, although patient was walking with frame, but we thought that since everything is in place now, no mobility and fibula is intact, we'll mobilize the patient with PTB. All right. Yeah. Sir, over to, over to Dr. John and Dr. Altaf for their precious comments. Okay. So two things. One, did you uh, graft the, non the docking site? No, sir. Nothing was done. Okay. Second thing is, I mean, it took a long time for this fracture to heal, okay? So, I mean, it's healed more or less by, as uh, Manish mentioned, by nature over a period of time. 
rather than the actual docking process. I think it's important, uh, especially where there's a long-standing non-union. Very often, it's better to freshen the bone ends and raft the docking site and then really compress it. Then the chances of getting a quick healing are more. I think I agree with six months, maybe a bit early to remove the fixator when you are, how much have you transported? Uh, it was something around seven centimeters, 6.5 so to then, seven centimeters. Then I don't know how you removed it at six months because it would take more than that for even the corticoid, uh, the regenerate to really be solid. So I would be a bit wary of that. But I, I mean, eventually the results are good, so you can't quibble on that, I guess. Okay. So, that the patient was so adamant to remove the frame yeah, because so we were happens. planning I, I to think... we were planning to freshen the site and we were also uh, trying to do some accordion compression at that fracture site because they, uh, we yeah, could not see good callus there but so adamant patient and after that covid era started sure. and we lost the patient for one and a half years definitely nature yeah. helped us in this case yeah probably that was a good thing because you didn't get anything more and it healed Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. okay. so uh, I'll, agree. I, I'll, I'll agree with Manish and Dr. John that it was nature that actually helped. Like, you see that having no pain, pain at the non-union site was itself a bad news because perhaps it was going more towards the non-union and the fibula was intact. And see, you see uh, that it's not always that uh, you go on docking by transport and then you will always get union. You see a soft tissue frame comes in between. A soft mm. tissue thin film comes in between the docking area and which leads it to this non-union. So it's a good idea always. You had all the bone docked and you had intact fibula. Small addition of bone graft at that time and maybe a fibular osteotomy would have helped put him union absolutely very fast because there are other things were already taken care of and the bone was vascular now. Second point, second point that uh, how comfortable you are you dealing with a deformity correction just based on the differential distraction. Instead of planning a motor unit and a hinge, the actual deformity method that you would be distracting on the motor okay. side, on the medial side, and then getting it corrected uh, by that rather than changing the hinge set many times and by relying on the differential distraction only. So why not a simple, uh, typical deformity correction using a motor unit? Uh, since we are doing it with uh, the hinges for long, I haven't no, used the motor see, unit. See, yeah, 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 because the hinges are used. In, this is no fun. In, your application of hinges is here is only to prevent the rod bending. Because if you put a straight rod and do a differential distraction, the rods will bend. Yeah. In order to compensate for the hinges will come into play. But the actual would be that this was a varus deformity. The hinges could have been placed at that time in a lengthening mode even. In a yeah. lengthening mode so that you would get by simply distraction on the motor unit, you would get both of them. Yeah, definitely. Anyways, that's a good case. Yeah, and just one more thing is the foot. Okay, so I think this is a, a very often seen problem with the elicera is the equinus deformity, which can become quite a problem for the patient. So it's a good idea to correct it alongside. So maybe you extend the ring to the foot and correct it while you're doing the rest of it. So because this equinus can sometimes be quite troublesome. I don't know how troublesome it was in this case. Sir, in this case, preoperatively, it was stiff due to two surgeries already done. Yeah, but you can correct it in the... Yeah. Room. We could have extended it to full prevent frame. Prevented getting worse with the extending it to the ring. Yeah. The ring Thank frame. you, sirs. The, uh, there was this. There was this qu little query on Ortho TV uh, from Doctor Praful Hirode uh, that, sir, you used pins in very porotic bone. Yeah. How was the hold? So I believe. Uh, I believe, sir. Uh, needless to say that you transport. You could manage to transport uh, six, seven centimeters without any. Uh, you know, no, it was a hybrid frame. Uh, some stanch yes. pins were used and patient was mobilized early, okay. full weight bearing. And we used the active and passive two aspects. The patient okay. was very active with us and with our advice. So Thank thereby. you. A young okay. patient also. Manish, I'm sorry, I have to leave. So uh, Sir. I won't be able to be there for the last case. So I think Altaf and maybe one of you can... Right, sir. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. It was actually Thank been a great session. So Thank you next time. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. you very much, sir. Thank, sure. Thank you for your presence here. It, it, Thank, it you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.
so so we'll move on uh, uh, to the last speaker the last case of the evening uh, dr shamshul huda sir needs no introduction he in addition to being a consultant at the wells hospital patna uh, he is our own joint sekhi of uh, the assami india and a very active assami india member uh, sir is there to uh, present his views on deformity correction and bone transport over illusoro and tens in lower limb so uh, dr huda sir over to you Thank you, Dr. Manish. Am I audible? Hello. You are audible, sir. We can yeah, see yeah. your slide also. Thank you, sir. So today I'm going to talk on uh, deformity correction and bone transport. Regularly, we don't use uh, tens, but uh, I have tried a few cases. Uh, deformity uh, correction and uh, transport uh, over tens. So this is one case, like uh, this uh, distal tibia post-traumatic uh, deformity, shiroarthrosis of tibia. The, like the some interesting uh, shown earlier cases. And this is a 13 years young boy. It's an adolescent boy with a whole history of injury, multiple failed treatments, and uh, chronic deformity, limb shortening, uh, infection, and there is a limb. There is shortening. You can see. So I planned laser surgery in this case. These are the clinical pictures. You can see there is a gross uh, soft tissue shortening also. There is infection at the tip also. And I, as I calculated with the bone in the app, there was around 74 degrees uh, deformity here. So normally in this cases, what you do, we use uh, hinges, gradual deformity correction over hinges. We do like in this uh, other, other cases we have done. So we do uh, with hinges uh, gradually, it takes time. It does very good correction. And a few cases we have done, we have used as uh, uh, multiple hinges in upper and lower limbs also. So, uh, and in few cases we have used uh, uh, ortho CV also. Now here, my uh, question is that uh, gradual uh, correction over laser with hinges has some hindrances in very acute uh, case, uh, deformities like this, not with some uh, lesser uh, deformities, like uh, there's an fracture tip is there. So it's very difficult to do gradual correction in these cases. Soft tissue contracture needs uh, release, so much of release. So we can have a neurological compromise also. So I used an alternate pathway, acute correction over uh, Elizero over 10. So acute correction over Elizero, we have advantage, like uh, complete debridement of the infected tissue, Sclerous bone, diseased peristome can be removed. Acute correction and docking can be done. You can remove the dead bone and lending from the pectosomalic end next can be done. Tense has advances of that uh, it gives internal stability. It works against deforming force. It gives transport access maintenance, uh, prevents translation, prevents structural <coughs> protein rate, and only it gives uh, advantage of maintaining the deformity correction. So here did an uh, acute correction in this case. And at the proximal moment, I did cortomy and did a gradual correction. With around the, around uh, four to five months was complete lengthening. And in the same process, you could see that uh, the tens shortened here. So after correction, I had to give some more stability. Normally, I've done uh, lengthening uh, on bone transport in the long cases, like around uh, 15 centimeters, take long time, and we had to uh, keep the ring for around uh, two years, one five to two years. This case, uh, use of tens reduces the time here. So while removal the ring at around one year complete, I could remove the ring and uh, I added more tens from the proximal lens you can see to give more stability. The ankle was also fixed with KVAS because of some uh, uh, valgus deformities so it was removed now. So here you can see there's a complete correction. We can, the patient could bend the knee uh, even up on the rings and after the removal. So at complete one year, I've uh, removed the uh, ring placed on uh, braces and patient can walk comfortably with the ring on and with the brace on. So here in this case, you can see that uh, it really uh, reduces the time that deformed for the satellite. In the Ritesh Manu's case, sir, I would uh, advocate uh, some uh, sort of uh, internal friction with like tens in this case. So this case has helped me a lot. So just to add on a similar case, uh, this is not a complete case, this is a similar case of non-union, affected non-union on the left side and on the right side deformity uh, also. So. I did the same, this case is in progress. Uh, just in four months, the complete uh, lengthening has been done. And on the right side, I've uh, done an acute correction with a uh, plate with some splinter uh, to cover uh, T plates also. So these cases can be uh, done very well with uh, uh, Elizabeth over tens and complete lengthening can be seen. Complete uh, deformity correction, full lengthening is there. So both the patients came to me, uh, put us back. One was, uh, one ring was removed and another one is waiting for another four months. So he's walking a little slow here. Just to complete uh, cases in the uh, femur, complete uh, rotation deformity of femur, you can see that is going backwards. So, I did a complete rotational correction acutely in the first stage. 
and then I did uh, gradual hinges. I put gradual hinges and did uh, gradual correction in these cases. So the first as you can see in the video, uh, the rotation question was done. Then after that, I used hinges and uh, then patient could walk after long or normally. Then after that, I in the first case, you can see there are uh, hinges in these cases. And one uh, with the hinges, the complete correction was done, almost complete correction. And I did also some uh, posterior release in this case. So uh, I just fixed this uh, for the, uh, temporarily, and you can see complete correction is there. So the deformity correction over tens, over hinges can be done. It's a very good thing. So uh, that is the take-home message that the deformity correction lending on laser over tens can be a very good option. And the, the same is my question to my masters, to my mentors that it, it fits good or not, it prevents deforming stress, gives internal stability. Early ring removal is a very good advantage. We can save six to uh, six months to 10 months of time saving. Bone graft, I talking said, maybe needed in a few cases. I really welcome you all, all my, all my uh, faculty and delegates for the upcoming uh, uh, Assam India Basic Laser of Course at AIMS Patna. And 17th and 18th of December, you can contact me. We have eminent national and regional faculty here. So just, just uh, uh, the, for the, Letter note, handle the rings well, they can be fire or flower. Thank you. Thank you, Shamshul sir. Shamshul, uh, good, good animation in the last time. Uh, uh, I request uh, Dr. Alta, please uh, come up. Yeah. Good presentation. <laughs> Dr. Shamsul, good presentation. I have a couple of concerns. Both of your patients were had basically a pathological limb. So both of them had seed orthosis. So naturally, there is no question of just treating the deformity. Like you said, that gradual correction in such a deformity, that the question doesn't arise. Because you have to deal with the pathology, actual pathology of the condition. is seed orthosis and you have to deal with the uh, hematoma and other things. So it's a typical uh, this uh, pseudoarthrosis. So there is no point in telling that we want to do whether gradual or acute. So you have to do, you have to treat the basic pathology. And then holding it with a tense is a good idea. No uh, problem in that. That's a known procedure that you use a self-lengthening, you use an elastic nail for that. That is the protocol. So even if you protect, so tense would take care of that. That is one. Second thing, uh, how did you correct the rotational deformity by hinges? Sorry, sir. How did you correct the rotational deformities by rotational deformity by hinge? So in the third case, sir. Yeah, yeah. In the femur, you had the rotational the femur, deformity. Sir, I did the uh, rotational deformity correction acutely, not with hinges, sir. I just did the rotational def deformity first. Put uh, a little. Uh, uh, those are uh, rings with hinges, just to, uh, and that uh, over ten I could gradually crush just a little more so that it can come uh, come to at least nearly so that uh, tens had uh, tens had, it can uh, have to attend to bend. No, so it's it. one thing to Shamsul that you have you have tens inside, you have the nails inside, and then you tend to do a rotational correction. Is it feasible? Your tens it has a three point fixation. So it gives you stability by at three points, at the two ends and the center, like the conventional nail would do. How would you do a deformity correction with something inside? And second thing, if you had to do acutely, then what is the fun of keeping the ring? You could have fixed with anything. My so idea of telling is that if you if you if you if you use if you need to do a rotational correction, you use derotation bar. You use the deregeneration bars so that yes. you gradually rotate it. Use the rod and over the posts so that you gone you gone lengthening, you gone transporting the post in a wheel fashion. Here, 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 and here. That is how you create a in this rotation correction. A hinge is supposed to do it in one plane, maybe anterior, posterior, middle lateral. It's not going to correct in a rotational way. So the idea of yeah, rotational correction is using trans the derotation bars like one on here, another here, and another here. So you go on transporting here, the ring moves here, and the ring moves here. So it gives a torque. That is how you do it. And in fact, for rotation, putting in uh, tens to begin with, I don't think is a good idea. It's so I've been used the traditional bars and uh, smaller uh, rotational uh, correction, but this was a complete. So that is the point. In case of a bigger correction, you need to go gradual. 
right so that is it is more effective in that rather than a smaller deformity may be you correct on table what a big deformity that needs to be correctly gradual needs a de rotation bars right. as hinge is not going to hinge is going to correct it in the medial lateral or anterior bit is one right. so it is will not de rotate so you may have to think about that right sir right sir thank you sir any other anybody wants to have a question about that ravi sir ravi sir please go ahead sir. actually not a question just a small comment that uh, in your first case you have used uh, what altaf sir has suggested that it's a protocol in pseudo arthrosis of using a tens nail or an elastic nail it's a protocol but uh, i think uh, you you could have avoided using uh, so uh, so number of nails why you have used four or five or six nails in that matlab you could have used a proper diameter nail even single nail could have worked or even two for more stability you could could have used two nails and that could have worked instead of using five or six because these nails when you remove it then they can cause the fractures there as, as well so well, I, i don't think so using so much so number of nails is a good idea and then if you use so many number of nails yeah. then what is the difference then the benefit of using a ring also external exactly. stability if you are comfortable exactly. with an internal stability why in external exactly thing? Exactly. What I planned that initially, just uh, I used two nails, and when the nails get shortened, then I added two more nails to give support only. So, okay, but uh, that's uh, in a porotic bone. Be. Using, uh, I agree with Ravi. Using in a porotic bone, so many nails. I don't think it's a good idea. Because right. in pseudo arthrosis, we are already having a pathological issue of refracture. It's a big issue. Do pele says that uh, zero refracture rates, but it's Dubious, but whatever, whatever. It's a, no, no, no. But, but he has a he has a point. Not only that, he's a master. It's a point. If you are increasing the cross section, you will get exactly, cross section. Exactly. Naturally, you don't you don't rely on single bone. So it's a chart exactly. of kind of four because, uh, areas that are concentrating at that point. Refracture, refracture is a very good, very big issue depending on the cross section area of that pseudo arthrosis site. Because in the first case of doctor, what doctor Jaswinder showed. the cross section area of the pseudo arthrosis side was very less and uh, i am afraid that uh, that that child may fracture refracture because cross section in second or third case cross section very areas that, are good agreed that's why i said revi in that case also because that it doesn't have a lateral support exactly. of fibula as well no, in no, stabilizing just, fibula is a good no, idea the like like yes like like pally said that pally says that it is not the getting union it is the maintenance of the unit that's more important so we need to be very uh, careful about that and especially in pathological conditions when we are not dealing with a simple deformity when we are dealing with a pathology as well so we need like to consider you see, you see both the things she dot cortic she dot cortic bone is not supposed to be normal so using too many tens at the proximal site is definitely going to give a peri implant fracture sometime exactly so exactly. one nail and then rely on something else Anyway, good, any way, good, good presentation. Any uh, more questions? Yeah, Over to you, Manish. Sir, one, sir, one small point on ortho TV, sir. Uh, Doctor Subranshu Chaudhary has asked, how acutely can we go for distraction, and can there be any nerve injury during acute distraction? I think uh, he has the answer and the question put together only, sir. But if you could just elaborate on that, basically, he wants to know that how, uh, uh, like how, uh, but uh, uh, what where. रुटीन कैन बी डन especially okay. in a valgus in a valgus knee you wouldn't like valgus femur you wouldn't like to do any acute correction or you might need to do the release of the cpl then only you might attempt yes. since here we are only discussing about the gradual correction i don't have a point in discussing acute correction how much you should do uh, that's a proper term is 
acute correction or gradual correction it's a pro- acute distraction i don't think so it's a no, it means, i think that's i think that's he means i think he means uh, how much correction. acute he could be correct mm-hmm. exactly we go, exactly, we go for acute compression not distraction any time <laughs> exactly 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 there is another question that how do you do cortotomy with nails inside the bone we use small scissors for that and another cm guidance we do that so what Uh, how do you do cortotomy with nails inside the bone with the tens inside the bone that you can do with small scissors uh, that that can be done easily no done. Yeah. we have to rotate it to break it to make the corticotomy complete exactly, exactly. so distract and rotate sir dr rajat agarwal uh, sir rajat sir are you there sir um, if you are there then if you could come to the screen and if you are not there sir yeah, then yeah, hey, rajat sir is there rajat sir is yeah, there yeah. okay yeah. sir There's few oh, comments sir. from you because we are about to wrap up, sir. Hello. Yes, yes sir. sir. Audible. Rajesh, sir, you have muted yourself. Acha, you are operating. Okay, okay, sir. Go ahead with the operative procedure, sir. Do not to get disturbed. Yeah, sir, I have I have one question to uh, Altaf sir. Uh, sir, yes, okay. uh, sir. For CPT cases means uh, uh, what what is your current protocol? Are you following Pele's uh, protocol of yeah, cross yeah, union? Yeah, yeah, I do. I did in three years. I did many cases with wonderful results. So you are using plate for fixation as no, no. I use a ring. I use a ring because it's too handy. I don't want to put in too much metal. i use few rings only just for stabilization and i use either a tens or a nail inside to prevent and i get good cross union and that's really helpful and one sir one, Because... i need to make one comment actually on dr jaswinder's first case or second even sir, third that uh, dr pele is using the graft just not for the un- just a union he is using that much of graft for the cross union as well for increasing the cross sectional area rather rather for cross union more rather for cross sectional area rather for increasing the cross sectional area yeah yeah i have seen that uh, getting a cross section and cross union is actual thing and yes, that in our part that we don't But use Dr. any sindhra said think... that now he has started using doing cross sections so cross yes, since last four cases we are doing it and one more thing i think uh, dr altaf has already said uh, what personally we are feeling is to fix a put a wire in the fibula also does help along with putting a wire in the exactly fibula, fibula stabilization sometimes is the key factor yeah yeah because pele's uh, recent recommendation is means what he to is doing is uh, doing a cross union put a plate over the tibia and a nail in the fibula and lengthening he does in the second stage once yeah, yeah, the yeah. cross union is achieved yeah, yeah. Yeah, because because Ritesh, if you intend to do a lengthening, then you have to do a different osteo if you uh, got this osteo before fibula. Yes. Because if you are achieving a cross union, so you can't lengthen. If you yes. want to lengthen in the same stage, then you have to have another uh, this osteo before the fibula, yes. isn't it? Because where would the limb move? There, uh, Doctor, I have two questions from my side. Yeah. So the first question is. Uh, do you use do you take the periosteum from the iliac crest and put it wrap it around the uh... yeah you see i do that but i think that is the most difficult one and you know in last assignment then i had a discussion with dr pal i asked him how do you manage to keep it flat because it wrinkles the moment you take the periosteum it wrinkles it is such a delicate thing to handle and do you know what he said he said i don't do it you don't need to you don't need to actually it is the cross union this back he might have tried all those things to uh, facilitate union and leaving no option so that's why he used periosteum he used graft he used bmp he used stability so these are all things and the circumferential removal of the this uh, hematoma to me right. in a small child that's the only difficult thing to me i feel that's the only difficult thing getting it because the hematoma might be adherent to the vessels so that gives little uh, jittery time getting it because you have the thready uh, uh, vessels and then you have the hematoma thick hematoma identifying them so many a times i don't use to indicate so i gone feeling at the same time it's a good okay. idea that this is my personal experience i don't use to indicate try to go delicate and remove the hematoma create the cross section 
and use the fixation and then use crossing. Right. And, and the second thing I is... disagree with Dr. John that Zolandonic is, you see one of my patients, he, he pressed to get his surgery done. He was coming and coming and going many a time. So he was so uh, curious that he wanted to get it done and he didn't uh, wait for the Zolandronic acid. And I did find a difficulty in his graft. Graph. I thought that his graft started getting resolved. Then we uh, did the product in the, the post-op, we gave him Zolandronic acid. I think it's a good idea to have Zolandronic because these bones are already so much corroded. And now so how, do you, how do you give Zolandronic Do we give it uh, one shot or exactly? I mean... There are surgeons who use it for like in one admission for three days. No, no, no. No, but it's a, over a period of time that like the trend conventional over this uh, infusion over a period of time, not for three days. It's so like infusion over a period of time, maybe one or yeah. two or two or three hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as per the dosage, recommended dosage, I think by point zero two or maximum, something like that. It, it can range from maximum two to three hours, not more than that. Yeah, we are also giving it preoperatively one month before as Palak uh, regimen has suggested, and we are getting good results during surgery. Yeah. We give preoperative gelatronic acid, then we operate the patient and uh, in CPT cases with good results. Dr. Jaswinder, that is a pamidronate, which is given for two to three days in cases right. of pamidronate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I was talking about pamidronate. Gelatronic acid, we hydrate the patient first, and then we give it with the dose of 0 0.05 milligram per kg body. Alpha, sir, have you been, just like the case of Ritesh, sir, uh, when the docking is not uh, in good union, have you ever planned to uh, put in a solid uh, titanium nail inside in cases? I do in few cases, sir. Then there's a chance where? of breakage. Alpha, sir. Where, where? So after, bold, after long bone transport, when you see the docking side is uh, not having a good union and uh, either not working with the bone graft, have you ever tried uh, putting in a solid titanium nail inside? I've tried in a few cases. To avoid refracture. No, 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 I didn't. I didn't. I didn't use after the uh, ring fixation. I didn't. Uh, Questioning of fracture side, docking side, and putting some bone graft and compression. That is the best answer for that because soft tissue always you want to come in between that. Samsul, you want to say that uh, you are not getting the union at the docking side. Not a good union. And thereafter, removal of frame and then putting a uh, intramedullary nail. Right, right, right. In a few cases, uh, I've done graft also on a uh, solid titanium intermediate nail. That but helps. you can put the graft uh, with the fixator on. Exactly. But uh, even after the removal of the fixator, just in one or two cases, I just see that it's not very well united. So just uh, impending to just for the impending but in case of in case of lengthening, don't you find lengthening. it difficult uh, to uh, passing through the regenerate and all the those solid things? Uh, solid uh, uh, reamer. That we use for I that, that's, I think in that way you can weaken the regenerate also. Altaf, sir? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't either. Rather, if I need to do, I would do a bone transport on a nail. That's a better option. Exactly. I do, yeah, I do bone transport if I feel that I should need it. And that really decreases the time. Yeah. I have done many cases where I would transport on the nail and get the transport. Dock no, 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 no. It, and yes, then, then, then what is the biggest thing is that the reamings at the docking side it really yes. tremendously help. So that exactly. once you have got the docking, lock it and finish. You're done. You're that, that's the better idea rather than using a uh, after you have through the, getting through the regenerate. It's quite. A, I think it's not an easy. That is, uh, that is uh, another perspective of lengthening of a nail that we've done in few cases. Uh, actually, yes. Samshal, what what Altaf sir is saying, Deco, it's it's better if you are suspecting something fishy yeah. later exactly. on. Then it's better to use nail previously. In that, yeah. then after the frame removal, you can even reduce the frame time also. Uh, yes, so it's, yes. It's better to use the nail beforehand. Yeah, yeah. It's, and then, I then think it's, not a, it's not a good have, idea of using but, nail after the frame. That, uh, there are two cases. First case is that we have already planned lending on nail. The second polio in other cases we have done. But in another cases like infected don't even, uh, we have done bone transport and then uh, docking. And at the end, after even the bone drop, just in one or two cases, I've seen the alignment is good. But the docking side is not in a good condition. So after one year, we cannot just plan of that. In one or two cases, I've used solid nail. That works. So there are two things. They're just uh, let me complete. But there are two things. One is if your docking side is not in align, alignment is not proper. Then when you are doing the nail, then we cannot use. Then we cannot use. When when you are doing the nail, it will it will move towards the anatomical axis. 
and mm-hmm. then you have to move that and regenerate will have a consequences only the right to regenerate is also a difficult task yeah yeah we, only the then, then, then it is always better that if you are not comfortable at the dock inside union you don't let that transition happen ever occur the moment you are in still in the frame freshen it at the bone graft little bone graft you need to add and then your job is done instead of then fiddling with a nail inside and then if you have used the proximal transport it will be always difficult to negotiate a nail through the region way exactly sir yeah, people do it people have done it to prevent the, the uh, to, to have facilitate the early removal of the ring but once you have all the pins inside you have all the chances of getting infection so had you had the nail before transport would be a better idea yes sir but that will and then that time that yeah. time the reaming itself at the docking side there will be deposited at the dock once the transport is coming you will have wonderful union to begin with yes, yes. it it but why you want to remove the frame basically you can do no, the no. grafting with the frame there must so be some reason that right? after some time he has found it reflexes what then yeah You don't let this condition happen. That means your uh, union is not comfortable. You are not like 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 we saw in the then you are, uh, previous re, 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 case. You have to wait more. Refractures, like, refractures like mostly. Really, refractures really, mostly occur really. because of the lax cross sectional area and the malalignment. Malalignment yeah. is one of the major factor in refractures. Doctor Ravi, like in like in Doctor uh, Reno's uh, case. Yes, it's sir. nature which came in to help. Exactly. Otherwise, normally it would it would always refuse to unite. Why should that happen? So don't let that tension happen. In those cases where we can do a primary docking, that is one of the best option, yeah. followed by lengthening. Yeah, but exactly. if we cannot do that, we should always keep the option open that we can go for if, opening the if you can site if you can do the pri- if you can do the primary docking, then you can avoid the docking site complications. Probably. Yeah, definitely. Because here because the docking site has also its issue issues in a, especially in long lengthenings. Long length is, is going to carry the soft tissue in between. Exactly. That is the judgment. Always. That is only prevented by if you have a nail inside. Yeah, exactly. So where we are going for fibulized intact, only tibial transport is there. So patient is always explained about these complications, and so that they are mentally prepared to go for second surgery if needed. Or so that, because to- that second that second surgery is not that a massive one, so not a big issue. Yeah, definitely. In order to prevent, I think we I think we have had enough discussion with this. Uh, Dr. Manish, over to you. Sir, uh, uh, I thank uh, each and every one of you, sir, on behalf of President uh, Assam India, Dr. Ruta Kulkarni. It really was uh, a nice uh, webinar, sir. We had a sumptuous discussion, and uh, Dr. Altaf as well as Dr. Uh, John, who is uh, presently not here. uh hats off to you sir for giving us so many pearls of wisdom and also the uh, speakers and thankful to each one of you and especially dr ritesh pande the state representative of bihar state of assam in india for um, you know heeding to my request and uh, organizing everything perfectly so uh, we will you, continue this much. academic program sir every month and next month it is the turn of karnataka state so we will tie up for everything and share the whole program So once again, thank you so much. Good evening, sir. Thanks, thank Dr. Manish. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Thank you. Good night. And thank you, my driver, Dr. Samshul. <laughs> okay, sir. <laughs> this last moment. Thank you, sir. And we again welcome you all right, for sir. this army course. <laughs> Take care, sir. Take care.